Woody Allen's fight with Mia Farrow for their children could be one of the biggest, ugliest scandals of its kind ever. Dylan seems teary-eyed as she describes what allegedly took place in the attic of their Bridgewater, Connecticut home. I didn't know what he was going to do. He just did it. And I you know. You know. On Saturday, July 11, 1992, Woody Allen went to Mia's house in Bridgewater, Connecticut to celebrate their daughter Dylan's seventh birthday. It was a delicate time in the family due to Woody's affair with Mia's daughter, Suni, whom he had been having relations with since December 1991 coming to light. Woody's relationship with Suni caused significant change in the family dynamics, and according to Mia, as a result, the children wanted nothing to do with him. Despite the family tension, Woody showed up to Dylan's birthday party with the promise and understanding that he would keep his distance and allow Dylan to enjoy her guest and her party. According to eyewitnesses, it was a promise, however, that Woody didn't keep. In her book, The Nanny's Tale, Mia's then-nanny Christy writes, quote, Five of the elder children were coming up from New York City for the occasion, and they wanted to avoid seeing Woody. Mia and Woody had a discussion about it, and he promised her that during the festivities, he would stay away from Dylan, allowing her to enjoy her party and her brothers and sisters. This, Mia felt, was especially important because the older children were all returning to Manhattan on the 5 p.m. bus. Come the party, and contrary to his word, Woody was all over the little girl. The other kids had no time to spend with her and felt excluded. So did Casey, Mia's friend, her husband, and their kids. Then Woody took Dylan down to the lake, completely isolating her from the rest of the guests. Afterward, Mia and Woody exchanged words. You never left her side, she said to him. His lack of remorse sparked her anger even further. He cared little that Dylan's brothers and sisters hadn't had a chance to spend time with her. As Mia said later, the whole day he had never taken his eyes off her, which he did all the time anyway. But that day, he promised he wouldn't. That evening, Mia composed her now famous note, which read, Child molester at birthday party, molded then abused one sister, now focused on youngest sister. This note concerned Woody, and he would later have a conversation with Dylan psychiatrist Dr. Susan Coates about it. At the time, he found the note to be a bit dramatic, but he would later believe that the note foreshadowed what was to come. In his book, Apropos of Nothing, Woody writes, quote, Remember this ugly note she pinned to my bedroom door was prior to any suggestion of abuse. Was she laying the groundwork for what would be a frame-up? I assumed from the note she was mentally out of control, and it never occurred to me I was being set up for a false accusation. Who thinks that way? A few weeks after the loony note, still prior to any allegation, she phoned Susan Coates, Dylan's doctor, and said, he must be stopped. Dr. Coates warned me about it. In hindsight, it's obvious a false accusation of molestation was to be her plan. And this quote-unquote plan allegedly took place on August 4th, 1992, during a visit with his children in which Woody Allen would later be accused of violating his seven-year-old daughter, Dylan. But according to Mia, what took place that day was not some concocted plan or plot to take Woody down. It was a tragedy that truly happened. It usually begins with an emotional domestic breakup, parents fighting over the kids. And then in the heat of a bitter custody battle, one party charges the other with an unspeakable and frequently unprovable crime using the children. In some cases, no doubt, the allegations are true. In others, a weapon of revenge. It's a story we've done before on 60 Minutes, but this one is different because everyone knows the parents, at least from the movies. The father is Woody Allen, writer, director, actor. The mother is Mia Farrow, his frequent co-star and the mother of his three children, two of them adopted. He is accused right now in the newspapers, perhaps later in a court of law, of abusing their seven-year-old adopted daughter, Dylan. Woody Allen doesn't deny having an affair with 21-year-old Sunyi Previn, whom Mia adopted when she was married to conductor Andre Previn. What he does deny is that last August at Farrow's Connecticut country home, in the midst of a bitter but still private custody fight, he molested. 
arrested seven-year-old Dylan. On Tuesday, August 4th, 1992, it was a warm, sunny day in Connecticut. Mia and the children were spending their summer vacation at their home, Frog Hollow. Per their visitation agreement, Woody was set to visit with Dylan and Satchel at Mia's house. Prior to his visit, Mia informed everyone that Woody was not to be left alone with Dylan and that they must not let him out of their sight. According to Mia, for years, she had growing concerns when it came to Woody's behavior with Dylan. She described his interactions with the child as inappropriate and intense, and it was something that she claimed Woody had allegedly been in treatment for for a few years. It's important to note that Woody has denied these claims. This was the little girl that he loved, and uh, and his love for her was a most unusual kind, as it turned out. But she kind of opened his heart. Mm-hmm. She did what, what none of the others mm-hmm. could do, except um, after about three years, it was a problem. It was a problem that we were addressing with a psychiatrist, a mm-hmm. psychologist. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, what was the problem? Excessive, extreme extremely, the judge, I'll use the judge's words because I have to be careful, grossly inappropriate behavior with this child. He was it intimate. Was disgusting, he was... and it was, it was all over her all the time in ways that were highly inappropriate and with sexual undertones, undeniable. I was seeing it. Um, And I, to this day, find it very, very difficult to understand how you can see something and know something and yet not believe it. I couldn't believe it. My mind just would not accept accept it. So I accepted his version that he simply didn't know how to relate to a child and that it was excessive and that it, it, his affection for her demonstrated itself in ways that expressed his need uh, and had nothing to do with the need of the child and that it was extremely intense, um, but that it wasn't sexual. But he was doing things that looked sexual and that were sexual. On August 4th, 1992, the day in question, Upon Woody's arrival, Mia, her son Isaiah, her daughter Tam, and her childhood friend Casey Pascal went out shopping for the day. At Mia's house were Dylan, Satchel, Christy, Mia's nanny, Sophie, the French tutor, Casey's three children, and their babysitter Allison Stickland. In her book, Mia writes that Moses, who was 14 at the time, went for a walk, but it would later be reported that he was actually present at the house. With errands to run that day, Mia instructed the adults staying back at the house to keep a close eye on Woody. In his book, Woody writes, quote, So, August 4th, 1992, I float up to Connecticut to see my kids as haggled by our lawyers. It's an uneventful afternoon. Mia goes out shopping while I watch a little TV with a room full of people all worn to keep an eye on me. I wander to the pool alone while they continue to watch. I make a phone call or two to kill time. Soon, Mia comes back. When Mia returned home from shopping, everything seemed normal, until it was pointed out that Dylan didn't have any underwear on. According to Mia, this detail was unusual, because Dylan was a very modest child, It wasn't like her to run around with no underwear on. In her book, Christy details this moment. Quote, From my point of view, everything seemed normal on August 4th except for one thing. That afternoon, for reasons nobody has ever been able to explain, Dylan, at age seven, was wandering around in her white sundress without her underpants. Nobody knew where they were. Nobody was ever able to locate them, nor did Dylan ever admit 
that she knew where her panties were. She said that she didn't remember what had happened to them. Yet, maybe the answer to this is less sinister than it seems. Maybe Dylan's panties had been wet or soiled from playing at the beach and she had just chucked them under a bed or into the laundry. Or maybe when she changed clothes in the middle of the day, she simply forgot her drawers and didn't notice that she was putting on a dress rather than sweatpants, which she often wore without undies. Still, Dylan's missing underwear and her distracted willingness to run around half naked seemed, at best, odd. It was the first thing Mia noticed when she returned home from shopping. It's important to note that Monica Thompson, another nanny for the Farrell household, provided two sworn affidavits to the court in Woody's defense for his 1993 custody case against Mia Farrow. In her affidavits, Monica claimed that she had a conversation with Christy, who allegedly told her that she didn't recall Dylan not having any underwear on. Despite this momentarily confusing moment of the missing underwear, Mia and Woody would go out to dinner later that evening, something that they often did, even though it was known that he was having an affair with her daughter, Suni. According to Woody, while at dinner, Mia brought up their next project that they were scheduled to begin filming in the upcoming weeks. And that movie was Manhattan Murder Mystery. Woody claims that Mia expressed her intentions to star in the film despite the family issues. But according to Mia, it was Woody who was adamant that she star in the movie. It must be noted, however, that when the S.A. allegations came out, Woody Allen fired Mia from the project. She accused me of child molestation on August 4th, right? Right. And that I molested my daughter, you, you know, my, that my, I molested my daughter. And August 5th, 6th, 7th, 8th, 9th, you know, the, the week after, she's fully saying, when do we begin our new movie? I'm going for my costume fitting next week. And uh, I, I, she made an appointment with the costume uh, designer on the movie. And, she, and I said, what do you mean the new movie? She's, and, uh, and she said, well, you know, I, I'm supposed to go in and see the costume designer. I got to get my fitting. And, I, and uh, we're going to begin shooting in another five weeks. And I said, are you kidding? You're accusing a child molestation? And you think we're going to just go on with the movie? What did you say to her? I said, that, you know, of course this is insane. I mean, I said, you know, I told my, my lawyer... Uh, that, you know, they, they should call her and terminate the contract. And I went out and hired uh, another actress to play the role. After dinner on August 4th, 1992, Mia and Woody returned to Frog Hollow, where he would read Dylan and Satchel a bedtime story. During story time, Mia's daughter, Tam, who was visually impaired, became enraged by his presence and caused quite the scene. Mia writes, when we got back to the house, he went upstairs, sat on Dylan's bed and began a bedtime story for her and Satchel. Tam, realizing who was in the room, started screaming, while Woody angrily and determinately proceeded with his story. I tried to calm Tam. After a while, I asked Woody if he'd please hurry the story a little, but he glared at me and continued. Dylan and Satchel were staring worriedly at Tam, and nobody could hear anything but screams. When finally he finished and went out, Tam brightened up. I kissed all the kids, turned on their nightlight, and left the room. Woody was waiting in the hall, livid. Just look at what you've done, he said. You better shape up, or there's no way you're going to be in this movie. I started crying again. Why is everything always my fault? I said to his back. Does it never occur to you that you might be in some part responsible for any of this? It's important to note that in Woody's autobiography, Apropos of Nothing, there is no mention of this quarrel. As his version goes, he and Mia went out to dinner. Upon their return home, he had story time with Dylan and Satchel. And the following morning, after playing with them for about one hour, he left and went back to Manhattan. The following day, on August 5th, 1992, Mia received a call from her longtime friend Casey Pascal with some disturbing information. According to Casey, her babysitter, Allison Sticklin, saw something the day before that she couldn't get out of her head. Mia writes, the next morning, after Woody left for the city, 
Casey phone to say that her babysitter, Allison, had seen something at my house that had bothered her. While Casey and I had been out shopping, Allison had gone to the television room looking for one of the Pascal children. She saw Dylan sitting on the couch, staring straight ahead with a blank expression. Woody was kneeling in front of her with his face in her lap. From what I can remember, uh, Mrs. Pascal and Mia went out to do shopping for a few hours. And myself and Mia's two, well, her babysitter and um, this French, stu- um, I think, tutor. French teacher, tutor, yes, right. sorry, tutor. We were all at the house watching the children and Woody came on a visit. And at some point during the day, I went, I didn't see one of the Mrs. Pascal's children. So I went in the house to have a look and I opened the door to this small TV room and when I opened it, I saw Woody on his knees, kneeling down in front of Dylan with his head in her lap. You're in the house. The children are playing everywhere. There's a TV room and the door is closed. Yes. All the children were outside playing. There's like a climbing structure outside. Um, but I went into the house and I opened the door to check in this TV room. And it was Dylan and... Woody in there and he was kneeling on the ground and he had his head in her lap and I just walked you know turned and went Alison how old were you at the time um 20 (laughs) my math sorry I was 65 so you were in your young 20s I was in my yeah mid mid 20s yeah so late 20s what what went through your head Oh, well, I was shocked. I thought it was very odd. I thought, you know, didn't know what to think of it, really. It's not something you expect to see a father and daughter, you know, situation to see a father and daughter in. So you open the door and you're expecting, you're just opening the door because you're expecting just to see like what's going on in the day and what kids are in there, correct? Like what, right? Is that why you walked in there? No, I went in there because I was looking for one of Mrs. Pascal's children. Ah, because I didn't, I didn't see them out in the garden playing with the other children no more. So I went into the house to look for Mrs. Pascal's child. Got it. That makes sense. So I just checked in that room because that's the room where some of the kids hang out, hung out sometimes because there was a TV in there and toys. So I thought, oh, maybe they're in there, you know, watching TV. Didn't want to play, so had gone off to maybe watch TV by themselves. And then you saw that. Mm-hmm. And what immediately goes through your head? Well, I just walked out and went back out into the garden. Um, I didn't really know how to react, but, you know, like I said, I was there to watch Mrs. Pascal's children, so I just continued to do that until they come back from shopping, and we went home. Was Did did Woody realize you had opened the door, or did you sort of creep back out quietly, or you have no idea? Um, no, I didn't creep back out. I'm I'm sure he was aware that I'd walked in because I just walked in as normal because there was no reason for me to go in quietly. I was looking for Mrs. Pascal's child, you know. I just, as you would, just open the door up. Right. Uh, oh, my so, God. Yeah, so I just sort of pulled the door back shut and went up, back out to the garden. Do you have any recollection of what Dylan's expression was? She was just sat there. It's like when I opened the door, there was no, I don't recall any conversation or laughter. She was just sat there. It was just quiet, you know. Knight, how, how did you end up discussing what you saw with, with, with Miss, Miss Pascal? It was later that evening when we were sat down having dinner together and it had been bothering me, obviously. And I just felt I, I needed to tell her I couldn't keep that to myself. You were struggling with telling her, though, because you also didn't want to tras- trespass a boundary. I mean, tell me what, what your thought process was. Were you conflicted because you were young and, like, maybe you shouldn't say something? Or, Well, yeah, but then I thought, you know, it's not right. I thought I had to tell her I don't – it's like I wanted an opinion. You know, was it, was it wrong? Was it right? It's uh, – it was very hard. I was just eating and I thought, no, I've, I've just got to get this off my chest. You know, I need to share it with Mrs. Pascal, you know. 
I mean, it's so shook you that you felt it was like a burden that you had to get off your chest. So, so you told Mrs. Pascal, and how did you tell her? Do you remember? I just said that I over at Mayors that day, I'd seen something that was bothering me and she asked me what and I told her. Wow. And how did she react? I can't remember actually. I think I can't I can't remember how she I yeah. I, I don't think we sort of went into a conversation about it. I right. can't remember if she said she would pass it on to me. I really can't remember the conversation I had with Mrs. Pascal. Well, she obviously passed the information on to Mia, which you would, wouldn't you, the child's mother. It's not something you'd keep from a child's mother. Right. And it just went from there, really. Upon hearing from Casey what her babysitter allegedly witnessed the day before, Mia then recalled Dylan's missing underwear. She immediately ended her call with Casey and questioned Dylan. She asked her, quote, if it was true that Woody had his face in her lap the day prior. Here's what Mia testified to in court. Quote, Dylan said yes. And then she said that she didn't like it one bit. No, he was breathing into her, into her legs, she said, and that he was holding her around the waist. And I said, why didn't you get up? And she said she tried to, but that he put his hands underneath her and touched her. And she showed me where, her behind. According to Mia, it didn't stop there. Dylan had more information to share. In her 1997 memoir, Mia writes, quote, I had just been videotaping the baby, so I grabbed the camera. She told me that Woody had taken her upstairs into the attic and that he had touched her private parts with his finger. Don't move, he had said to her. I have to do this. If you stay still, we can go to Paris. Don't tell. He was kissing me, Dylan said. I got soaked all over the whole body. I had to do what he said. I'm a kid. I have to do whatever the grown-ups say. It hurt. It hurt when he pushed his finger in. He said the only way for me to be in his movie is to do this. I don't want to be in his movie. Do I have to be in his movie? He just kept poking it in. I know if you get that day, but I keep on remembering. I try to forget. Did you? I never got a chance. I had to do it. He said he was my daddy. He had. He had. Yeah, I'm, I'm kidding. I have to do whatever the grown-ups say. I know. I know. It's, it's, Dawn, it's not I your should... fault at all. It's not your fault at all. There was nothing you could have done. You were just a little girl. I, I didn't know what he was going to do. He just did it, and I didn't... I know. I know. And it still, it still hurts you? Yeah. Did your daddy do that when you were a kid? No, honey, no. No, daddies don't do that. I wish it was Andre who was my daddy. He would have taken better care of me. My little sweetheart. Oh, my hand. Because his daddy didn't do anything bad to him when he was a little boy. According to Christy, Mia's nanny, upon Dylan's disclosure... Mia immediately contacted three people. She called Dr. Nancy Schultz, Dylan's psychiatrist, who had been treating the girl for severe shyness and separation anxiety. She called Satchel psychiatrist Dr. Susan Coates, whom Mia claimed treated Dylan and Woody for his inappropriate and intense relationship with the child. And it's a claim that Dr. Coates denied. Dr. Susan Coates told the court, that Dylan was brought in because, quote, she would be taken over by fantasy. It should be noted that both Dr. Nancy Schultz and Dr. Susan Coates was on Woody's payroll. He paid their salaries. In addition to contacting Dylan's doctors, Mia contacted her lawyer, Eleanor Alter, who, after hearing the attic allegation, advised Mia to take Dylan to the pediatrician. In Mia's memoir, however, the order in which she called the aforementioned individuals is a bit different. 
According to Mia, the person she contacted first was her lawyer. She wouldn't contact the psychiatrist until after Dylan's second visit with the pediatrician, which took place on August 6, 1992. Per her lawyer's advice, Mia took Dylan to the pediatrician for the first time on August 5th, 1992. It was the same day that Casey informed Mia about what her babysitter allegedly saw. Upon arriving at the doctor's office, Mia privately spoke to the pediatrician first. According to court testimony, Mia told the doctor what Dylan had told her. But when the doctor questioned Dylan, she clammed up. Here's what Christy writes in her book. Quote, First, Mia spoke to the doctor privately, describing to him what Dylan had told her had occurred the previous day. Then the doctor took Dylan into his office alone. Here, he asked the child to tell him what had happened. Dylan hesitated, then said merely that Woody had touched her. Where, he asked. On the shoulder, she said. According to Mia, Dylan told the doctor that Woody had put his face in her lap and touched her. But when probed further, she refused to speak. When they left the doctor's office, Mia took Dylan to go get ice cream, where she confronted Dylan and asked her what was the truth. In her book, Christy recaps the conversation. Quote, Mia asked gently but firmly, what is the truth? What you told me or what you told the doctor? Dylan replied, what I told you. Then she hesitated and added, but I don't like to talk about my privates. According to court testimony, when they got home, Mia called the doctor and told him what Dylan had told her. He noted that Dylan's reaction was a common one in children who had been and that Mia should bring her back the next day. According to Woody Allen, Mia's treating Dylan to ice cream was a way to encourage her to change her story from what she originally told the doctor. In his eyes, this was one of several examples in which Mia manipulated Dylan. According to court testimony, when Mia and Dylan arrived home after meeting with the doctor, Mia began videotaping the child over a 24-hour period. In her book, Mia writes that whenever Dylan brought up the allegation, she turned on the camera to document it. But according to Monica Thompson, Mia's videotaping of the child wasn't as innocent as it seemed. In her affidavits, Monica writes, quote, I know that the tape was made over the course of at least two and perhaps three days. I was present when Miss Farrell made a portion of that tape outdoors. I recall Miss Farrell saying to Dylan at that time, Dylan, what did daddy do? And what did he do next? Dylan appeared not to be interested, and Miss Farrell would stop taping for a while and then continue. Mia's choice to videotape Dylan during this period would be scrutinized and criticized, and it would be a decision that she would have to answer to for decades to come, as she would be accused of coaching Dylan. Did you ever coach Dylan no. into making up the accusations of Of course not. No, I mean... Dylan was speaking spontaneously and I grabbed a camera and it is clear, I mean the judge has seen that tape, that the child is speaking, there were times when I was even interrupting her, she's speaking from her own heart and uh, it's a very upsetting tape and it's obvious to anybody who, who, who sees it that there's no coaching there. Um, even Mr. Allen knows that. First of all, he knows Dylan, and you can't coach Dylan into anything. And second of all, it's obvious from the from the quality of what she's saying, from the from the urgency with with which she's saying it. Prior to Dylan's second visit with the pediatrician, Mia would briefly talk to Christy on the phone and inform the nanny about the attic allegation. In her book, Christy recaps the conversation. Quote. I can't really talk right now, Mia said when I phoned her from Boston on Thursday, August 6, 1992. But I have to tell you that Woody molested Dylan. What? I screamed into the receiver. Oh, God. There was a long silence before Mia picked up the conversation. In a quiet voice, 
She told me that she was on her way to her doctor's office to have Dylan examined, but that I should call later. I was left in the dark as to the particulars of what happened. According to court testimony, contrary to Dylan's first visit with the pediatrician on August 5th, 1992, during Dylan's second visit on August 6th, she told the doctor about the attic allegation and what Woody Allen had allegedly done to her. In her book, Mia details this visit, writing, quote, We returned to the doctor's office and Dylan repeated what she had told me. The doctor called later to tell me that he was required by law to notify the authorities, although the physical exam of Dylan showed no sign of S.A. Upon the pediatrician notifying Mia that he was going to report the allegation to the Connecticut authorities, Mia contacted the children's psychiatrist, Dr. Susan Coates. According to court records, Dr. Coates told Mia that she intended to tell Woody about the allegations, which was something that Mia was strongly against. In her book, Mia writes, quote, I phoned the therapist who'd been working with Woody for almost two years about his behavior with Dylan. As soon as I told her what Allison had seen him doing, she interrupted and said, he's not supposed to do that. I told her all of it, and she said that if the Connecticut doctor was going to report it, then she would have to report it as well to the New York authorities. But first, she was going to tell Woody. Don't tell him, I said. I'm scared of what he'll do. Can't you just deal with it? Don't report it to the authorities. That will destroy everything. It's too big. Terrible things are going to happen. Though Mia describes feeling a sense of fear and dread, Monica Thompson claimed that Mia exhibited a different demeanor, one that showed no fear at all. In her affidavits, Monica told Woody's lawyers that Mia seemed quite delighted, writing, When they arrived home, Pharaoh told me that everything is okay now, everything is set. She seemed very happy and excited for herself. According to reports, Mia's behavior during this period would be questioned, with many saying that she would go from being unusually calm to full of rage. Let's not forget my little daughter and all that happened to her and what she has told me that he did to her. There's all of that. And once that happened, I became a different woman. I fought. I fought for her. And I stood by her all the way. And I can tell her that. You know, that once I really believed and understood, you know, really quick what had happened, then I was a different woman. You were strong towards There is no one stronger on this planet. Once I understood what my little daughter told me what happened to her, Dylan, she was then seven. And then from that moment on, I changed. Do you hate Woody Allen? Dr. Coates would follow through with what she told Mia she was going to do, in addition to contacting both the New York authorities and the New York City Welfare Administration. Dr. Coates informed Woody that he was being accused of child SA. During a session with him on August 6, 1992, Dr. Coates gave Woody a heads up and strongly advised that he no longer see Dylan for the time being. According to Woody, this was a huge shock and at the time, something he didn't see coming. He writes, She broke the news to me that I was being accused of and she had to report it. It was the law. I was dumbfounded and couldn't believe it. I thought the whole notion was preposterous. I said, no problem, report it. Coates would testify that unlike actual predators, I made no attempt to dissuade her from reporting it. That was because I hadn't done anything and assumed no sane person would take the idea of me violating anybody seriously. What had happened was that during my visit, while Mia had gone shopping after explaining to everyone that I had to be watched carefully, all the kids and the babysitters were in the den watching TV, a room full of people. There were no seats for me, 
so I sat on the floor and might have leaned my head back on the sofa on Dylan's lap for a moment. I certainly didn't do anything improper to her. I was in a room full of people watching TV mid-afternoon. Allison, the nervous babysitter for Mia's friend's children, prompted by Mia to be hypervigilant, reported to her employer, Casey, that at one point I had my head on Dylan's lap. Even if so, it was utterly harmless and totally appropriate. No one said I S.A. Dylan, but when Casey phoned Mia the following day and said her babysitter reported my head was on Dylan's lap, the head on the lap would over time somehow metamorphosize into my harming her in the attic. A gigantic industry has been built on a total non-event. And when I say a total non-event, I mean a total non-event. It wasn't, it wasn't as if, you know, I tickled my daughter or something and much has been exaggerated. I'm saying nothing at all. I mean, I, I went up and played with the kids, read them stories, did, did my usual things. We played out on the lawn and, and um, you know, had a wonderful time with them. And out of this has grown lawyers and psychologists and district attorneys and private investigators. And I mean, I'm saying it's a multi-million dollar industry that has sprouted up over a total non-event. It may be a non-event to Woody Allen, but not to Mia Farrow and not to authorities in Connecticut, who are required by law to investigate every reported incident of alleged child abuse. The allegations are that you took Dylan into a attic or crawl space, mm -hmm. that uh, you touched her in her private part. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is there any truth to that at all? Look, be, be logical about this. I'm, I'm 57. Isn't it illogical that I'm going to, at the height of a, a very bitter, acrimonious custody fight, drive up to Connecticut where Nobody likes me in the house. I'm, I'm with a house full of enemies. I mean, Mia was so enraged at me and, and she had gotten all the kids to, to be angry at me that I'm going to drive up there and suddenly on visitation pick this moment in my life to become a child molester. It's just, it's just incredible. I could, if I wanted to be a child molester, I had many opportunities in the past. I could have quietly made a, a, a custody settlement with Mia in some way and done it in the future. I mean, you know, it's so insane. Why then would Alan's seven-year-old daughter tell a Connecticut doctor otherwise? Either she has been coached methodically to, to um, tell the story because... By Mia. By Mia, yeah. With Woody back in Manhattan, Mia and the children remained in Connecticut at Frog Hollow. On Friday, August 7, 1992, three days after the alleged incident, Christy, Mia's nanny, drove from Boston to Connecticut to resume her shift. Upon completing the three-hour drive, Christy picked up Monica Thompson from Mia's house and drove her to the bus station. According to Christy, Monica was set to go on vacation and wouldn't return to work until September. What Christy didn't know was that Monica was actually going to meet with Woody and his team in Manhattan. It's important to note that Monica was on Woody's payroll. He paid her salary. Christy was on Mia's payroll. Mia paid her salary. On their way to the bus station, Christy and Monica would have an interesting conversation, a conversation that Christy would later regret. Quote, as soon as we pulled out of the driveway, I asked her, Monica, what happened? What's going on? She shrugged and said, I don't think anything happened. I think Mia is exaggerating. She's trying to make you feel bad for not staying with Dylan the entire day. Monica knew only the sketchiest details of what had supposedly transpired. Although she had been working for Mia for seven years, they weren't close at all. And so I played dumb and agreed with her. Yes, I said, Mia must have been stretching the truth. And no, I didn't remember leaving Dylan alone with him. Then, without asking or answering any more questions, I drove back to Frog Hollow, my foot on the gas pedal the whole trip. My conversation with Monica would one day come back to haunt me. And come back to haunt her, it did, because it corrupted Christie's credibility as a witness. 
After dropping Monica off at the bus station, Christy raced back to Mia's house. Upon her arrival, she sprinted up the stairs and into Mia's bedroom, where she found the actress sitting on the floor in a sunken demeanor. Here's what Christy described. Quote, her face was red, with tears staining her cheeks and lashes. She was on the phone to her mother, talking with a frightening intensity. As she spoke, she motioned to me and pointed to a tape that was sitting beside her on the floor. Getting up, she put the tape into the video machine and pushed the play button, then took the phone and walked into the adjacent nursery, allowing me to watch the tape all by myself. It is chilling. It begins with Dylan sitting on Mia's bed. Mia holding the video camera is not in the picture, but we hear her asking Dylan questions like, where did daddy take you? And Dylan answers, he took me to the attic. And Mia asks several more questions while Dylan sits on the bed. Then the scene shifts to the lake. Now we see Dylan lying in one of the lounge chairs by the water. Mia asks her questions like, where did he touch you? And Dylan, whose legs are slightly open, says, he touched me here, and he touched me here, and he touched me here. Each time she says this, she points to her genital areas. During this scene, Dylan seems manic and distracted, and there are many interruptions. She gets up from her chair often. Finally, one distraction too many, Mia stops the tape. When Mia starts the tape again, Dylan says, Mommy, it hurts there, it hurts there, and holds her genital area. Mia pauses. She sounds very upset. And Dylan says something about Woody putting his finger inside her. Dylan says again, it hurts. Toward the end of the tape, Dylan repeats her claim that Woody has taken her to the attic and has told her that if she doesn't move, if she lies very still, he will take her to Paris and put her in his next movie. Then she says, a serious expression on her face, I don't want to be in the movie, and I don't want to go to Paris. The tape closes as Dylan looks at Mia and asks, Mommy, did your daddy do this to you? It's way beyond that now. What you've done to Suni, what you've done to, to, to Dylan. What you've done to Dylan, Dylan's a baby. How could you do that to her? I don't know anything of the kind. I know what Dylan tells me. You've told me nothing but lies. Dylan tells the truth inconsistently. No, I don't know that, Woody. I've always, always wor been worried about you and Dylan. And I didn't know the doctor had to report this to the authorities. I didn't know that. I went just to be sure she was all right. And she's not all right, Woody. She walks around the house holding her vagina. She sleeps with me. She's scared of you. And you hurt her. And I feel pretty guilty myself that I wasn't there to protect her. She said, Mama, you didn't help me. She said, Daddy, you shouldn't have done that. He shouldn't have hurt me like that. If, if he hurt her, you would weep inside. And you would just want to be dead. Because I don't know how you can live with what you did. According to court testimony, on August 4th, 1992, Woody and Dylan were unaccounted for for about 15 to 20 minutes. According to the adults present at Mia's house that day, none of them could locate Woody or Dylan for the aforementioned length of time. It's been alleged that this 15 to 20 minute window was when Woody took Dylan to the attic and S aid her. In her book, Christy writes, quote, when we retraced our steps on that day, there were 15 to 20 minutes in which Dylan was out of my sight, Sophie's, Casey's, or Allison's. Of course, those are the suspect 20 minutes when Mia alleges the SA must have occurred. 
it's important to note that there has been no concrete understanding, confirmation, or consensus among Christy, Sophie, or Allison as to what time of the day this 15 to 20 minute window occurred. It's also important to note that according to Monica Thompson, Christy told her on August 7, 1992, that, quote, she did not have Dylan out of her sight for longer than five minutes. Where were you? Can't you tell me that? If I'm to consider, if I were to consider for a moment that Dylan made this whole thing up, then tell me where you were. What room were you in? They searched the whole house for you. They searched the field. They called everywhere. Where were you? Where did you take Dylan? We'll have to talk about with that when the time comes. No, tell me now. Talk about Christy and Danny and Sophie and whoever is there. I said, you know, we'll have to. I'll have to talk to a number of people, and we'll see what we'll see what comes out. Well, why don't you just tell me where you were? You know? Why don't you just tell me what room you were in? You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I'm saying, I'm saying, if Dylan was lying, and that you never took her in the attic, then just tell me where you were. Christy and Sophie and Casey's babysitter, they looked everywhere for you. Where were you? Well, they'll have a chance to tell their story. Well, why can't you just tell me? I don't think that they were lying for you. Well, then you just tell me the truth. Where were you? I'm not asking anybody to lie. Nobody's lied. Tell me where you were. You're stuck, right? From Woody's perspective, the attic allegation was a ridiculous stunt coordinated by Mia, who he says was fueled by rage, jealousy, and anger because of his affair with her daughter, Suni. In 2018, Moses Farrow would come forward and publicly defend his father. In his blog, he writes, quote, As the man of the house that day, I had promised to keep an eye out for any trouble, and I was doing just that. I remember where Woody sat in the TV room, and I can picture where Dylan and Satchel were. Not that everybody stayed glued to the same spot, but I deliberately made sure to note everyone's coming and going. I do remember that Woody would leave the room on occasion, but never with Dylan. Along with five kids, there were three adults in the house, all of whom had been told for months what a monster Woody was. None of us would have allowed Dylan to step away with Woody, even if he tried. Casey's nanny Allison would later claim that she walked into the TV room and saw Woody kneeling on the floor with his head in Dylan's lap on the couch. Really? With all of us there? And if she had witnessed that, why wouldn't she have said something immediately to our nanny, Christy? On Sunday, August 9th, 1992, Five days after the alleged incident, Dylan underwent a physical examination where she was sedated. According to reports, the results showed no signs of S.A. A few days later, Dylan underwent another physical examination. According to Christy, she and Mia took Dylan to St. Luke's Roosevelt Hospital in Manhattan for an internal examination under the guidance of the New York City Child Welfare Administration. In her book, Christy recaps the exam, writing, quote, Mia was so convinced of the abuse that she seemed anxious and eager for this delicate internal exam to take place. Yet again, Dylan flipped out, crying and insisting she didn't want it done. Frankly, Mia would have gone against her daughter's wishes, and she actually begged the doctors to sedate the little girl. Mia had been told that the hospital had instruments of such sensitivity that they could detect all sorts of foreign substances and vaginal bruises. Well, St. Luke's refused to knock Dylan out against her will, which is too bad in one sense, since Mia felt certain that the test would have offered closure for better or for worse. 
It must be noted that the results of this examination would also indicate that there was no evidence of S.A. When Woody found out about these allegations, he reportedly spoke to Mia and informed her that he intended to both publicly announce that he was dating Suni and pursue full custody of the children. According to reports, Mia begged him to give her two weeks to further investigate the situation. In her book, Christy writes, quote, I remember one specific moment when we were standing in the kitchen in Connecticut. Mia had just had a strained telephone conversation with Woody about the alleged S.A. Please, just give me two weeks to investigate this, she had begged him. Please hold off. Don't call lawyers or anything yet. And Woody replied in a voice so loud that I could hear it through the phone. I will not hold off. This is absurd. And I can't even believe that you're accusing me of this. After they hung up, Mia went downstairs and asked her daughter once again, Dylan, you've got to tell me, is it true? And Dylan said, yeah, it's true. Then she ran out of the house. Now, I witnessed that, but I didn't know what to make of it. A part of me had hoped that Dylan had made it up. After all, nobody wants to think that Woody Allen could be capable of such a heinous act. What's more, as I've mentioned, I felt responsible for the events of August 4th, since Dylan was in my care that afternoon. Still, I had been puzzled by the vigilance with which Mia herself had been watching for signs of molestation. It had sometimes seemed as if she were willing the incident to happen. Another thing the Vanity Fair article said, uh, another accusation in the Vanity Fair article, um, Woody wearing just underwear would take Dylan to bed with him and entwine his body around hers. Or that he would have her suck his thumb. Can you picture that? I mean, is it, you know, all right. Of course, absolutely ridiculous. Um, I, the, there have been a number of things, you know, that, that have been tried, that Mia has tried to use against me by um, s- spectacular embellishment. There was one time when I was sleeping in the country, whenever I went up to the country, Mia always slept in the bedroom with the kids. And I always slept by myself in the other bedroom. Because as I said, we had these parallel lives. Uh, usually I wake up early, very early in the morning from you know, my habit from filming. One morning, on one occasion, the kids woke up uh, earlier than me. I was still asleep. They raced into my room, jumped into my bed, piled on me, scrambled with me. I sleep in my underwear, you know, scrambled on me. You know, after two minutes, three minutes or something, I got out of bed, put my clothes on and got dressed. That's it. That's the full extent of it. I never, ever in my life, not once, not on a single occasion in my life, ever got into bed with Dylan or, or, or Satchel in my underwear and entwine myself for anything but but an innocent little thing like this J- just like when when dylan would run i would pick her up you know i'm a father and i'm demonstrative i come from a demonstrative family and and i'm you know people have have imputed this to ethnicity and maybe it is maybe it isn't i don't know i see it all over i never did anything you know um that i didn't see at my house i, I have a good relationship with my parents dylan would jump in my arms and you say, well, you grab her around the bottom. And I said, well, yeah, I can't lift her up any other way. I mean, she's, you know, four years old. I, I have to. Um, and so that becomes suddenly an accusation. So I never, you know, you know, Dylan may have in the course of our life together grabbed my thumb and stuck it in her mouth once or twice in my life, you know, if she did that. But that's it. I didn't, you know, picture me. I mean, you, 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 even just knowing me as you do from, from, as a public person, as in, from my films or something, do you think that, that I get my kicks going over and sticking my thumb in my six-year-old daughter's mouth or my four-year-old daughter's mouth? And, you know, it's insanity. But these things become, um, because there is nothing really to say about me, these things become, um, you know, embellished and built up and made into, into accusations. Woody Allen sued Mia Farrow for custody of Dylan, Satchel, and Moses 
on August 13, 1992. According to Woody, Mia was an unfit mother and he needed to protect his children. In his complaint, Woody accused Mia of the following. Respondent has been and presently is emotionally disturbed and is under constant heavy medication. Upon information and belief, the respondent has physically abused one or more of her children. Petitioner believes that the children are in great fear of the respondent by reason of her emotional instability and abusive conduct. Respondent's past and present actions have created great emotional distress for the children, which has necessitated psychiatric intervention. Respondent has falsely accused the petitioner of S. Ang, Dylan, and Satchel, and continues to falsely claim that petitioner is guilty of S. Ang them. Respondent is brainwashing the children with respect to false allegations of sexual misconduct on the part of petitioner. Respondent who is unable to manage the rearing of nine children recently adopted Tam Farrow and Isaiah Farrow. Tam is 12 years old and blind. Isaiah is a seven-month-old crack baby. Petitioner has been informed that the respondent has made application to adopt two additional children, both of whom are blind. Respondent is incapable of raising any additional children. It is in the best interest of Satchel, Moses, and Dylan that physical and jural custody be awarded to their father, the petitioner herein. Petitioner is a capable and fit parent to assume sole custody of the children and possesses the ability to provide them with a happy, healthy, and stable home environment. News of Woody's lawsuit against Mia would leak to the media and everything that the family had been dealing with privately would now become a spectacle and media fodder. According to Woody, he was fighting to save his children. But the way Mia saw it, Woody was trying to get ahead of what was about to come out so that he could control the narrative. In her book, Mia writes, quote, Incredibly, in a frantic effort to distract the public from the facts and salvage the mythology of his reputation, Woody was seeking to make me the issue. It was a preemptive legal action initiated when it became apparent to him that a criminal investigation of his conduct was about to become public. On the same day that Woody's lawsuit against Mia went public, his lawyers met with her lawyers for a private meeting. According to reports, Woody's attorney, Erwin Tannenbaum, met with two of Mia's attorneys, Alan Dershowitz and David Levitt. According to Tannenbaum, Levitt proposed a settlement that included Woody Allen paying Mia Farrow millions of dollars to, quote, make everything go away. In court, Tannenbaum testified to the following, quote, Mr. Levitt said the charges could be made to go away. He told me, we can work out a deal that would involve $7 million or $8 million. At some point, Dershowitz asked, couldn't we do a down and dirty settlement for $5 million? According to Tannenbaum, he rejected the deal and walked out. Allen's trial attorney, Elkin Abramowitz, portrayed the proposal as extortion, something Mia's team denied. In his book, Woody Allen addressed this meeting, writing, quote, Four lawyers in a room testified Dershowitz made that offer. I understood it and have always said openly that I did not think it was the shakedown my lawyers thought it was, but an attempt to keep both Mia and me from getting into a messy public conflict. I recall him saying the issue should not go to court. It should be settled quietly, sparing us both mudslinging publicity. He and Mia calculated my kids' school expenses for their lives through college. Three kids, support, private schools, college. Anyhow, his adding machine came to 7 million skins, but I wouldn't settle. I said, I don't care about bad publicity. I never harmed Dylan, and I'm not settling for a dime. I was not afraid of the truth and was not going to buy silence. I couldn't care less about my reputation. I was ready to go to court and declare with total honesty that I never harmed anyone in my life. And I was ready to defend that statement publicly. 
What's your status of your relationship to the Woody Allen Mia Farrow controversy? I'm consulting with Mia Farrow. She called me when the story uh, first broke, actually just before the story broke, and asked me if I could help her resolve it. I thought people would have the good sense to sit down and resolve it quietly and privately, and then Woody Allen and his lawyers filed this uh, silly lawsuit, uh, alleging that she was an unfit parent, and it hit the fan. At that point, uh, I became more of an advisor and less of uh, a reconciliator, and the case is now in litigation or settlement. I hope yeah. it settles. Okay, let me tell you some things I need to clear up. Did Woody Allen ask you to come in first? It was no, 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 it never, no. It never occurred that Woody Allen wanted you in, oh, involved. No, no, she called me, she called. and in fact, Woody Allen was quite surprised that she called me, but he agreed to have his lawyers meet with all of us to try to resolve this. Second, uh, do you believe that that suit was filed because uh, of something else that was going on? Sure. Oh, yeah. I, know, I think it was a preemptive effort to deflect attention away from what uh, inevitably he believed was going to come out. I think he was wrong. I don't think it ever had to come out. If he had not filed that suit, I don't think anybody would know the story today, and I think it would be resolved uh, quietly behind the scenes. Uh, it seems to me he just shouldn't have done what he admitted doing with respect and to the then, with respect, with to, respect his to his affair Sunni, with Sunni. and then when he says to time magazine i don't even see the moral dilemma of it anybody who doesn't see the moral dilemma a man who has written such brilliantly moral films there's a blind spot and it's a tragedy it is also a real tragedy if if children are being used as pawns in this thing. No question. I would you never know, in any way participate in a case in which I believe the child was being used as a pawn for adults to satisfy any kinds of uh, desires or goals. If I thought that for a minute, so sure that's not happening? I'm sure about that. I'm absolutely how sure. How can you be I know so Mia, sure? And I've seen the interaction between Mia and the child and uh, even the best of friends of uh, of Woody Allen are not uh, are not saying that Mia put her up to it. Mia cares too deeply about her children. I just absolutely don't believe that. And if I believe that for a minute, I'd drop out of the case. On August 17, 1992, Woody Allen and Suni Previn would go public with their relationship. That same day, the Connecticut State Police publicly announced their investigation into Dylan's accusations. On August 18, 1992, Woody Allen held a press conference where he denied violating Dylan and asserted his innocence. Over the years, you all know that, that uh, I've been <clears throat> reluctant to speak with the press and have assiduously avoided publicity. But because of all the rumors and innuendos and cruel untruths circulating over the past week, I feel that I have to make a statement. First, I'm greatly saddened that sources close to Mia Farrow have released to the public allegations instigated by her of child abuse on my part. This, my lawyers tell me, is a currently popular, though heinous card played in all too many of child custody fights, and while sometimes effective, the tragedy of programming one's child to cooperate is unspeakable. The truth is that I have tried in private for the past eight months to work out the details of a humane shared custody that respected both mother's and father's rights. I hope that despite many conflicts and much anger, that with calm and compromise, I could obtain an agreement in the best interest of the children. Then, suddenly and appallingly, I was accused of having molested my beloved seven-year-old daughter and hysterically the next day of molesting my dear four-and-a-half-year-old son. This last allegation has quietly vanished, I suppose, because its substance was too insane even for the instigator to stay with. These totally false and outrageous allegations have sickened me so that I felt that for the sake of all my three children, I must try and remove them from an atmosphere so unhealthy it can surely leave irreparable scars. This is an unconscionable and gruesomely damaging manipulation of innocent children for vindictive and self-serving purposes. 
to make matters worse, if that were possible, several days ago, attorneys representing the other side called a meeting with my own, informing them that any publicity, even if the allegations are totally unfounded, would hurt me. They then proceeded to demand $7 million, saying that if I submitted to their demands, they would not press the allegations, and that they could make my children unavailable to the authorities. A few days after Woody's press conference, his publicist announced that he had taken and passed a polygraph test, a test that Mia Farrow reportedly refused to take. In his book, Woody Allen details his decision to voluntarily take the test. Quote, I took a lie detector test from someone the Connecticut police had the highest respect for, Paul Minor. He was the chief polygraph examiner for the FBI from 1978 to 1987. I passed easily. But when we asked Mia to take the same test, she refused. I knew I had truth on my side, which I now know is no assurance of anything. The authenticity of Woody Allen's polygraph test has been questioned over the years, as some speculate that he and his team manipulated the results in his favor. After Woody's publicist announced the results of his polygraph test, he and Suni would do separate interviews with Time Magazine and Newsweek. Now that they had gone public, their relationship was front and center. According to Woody, he would attribute his relationship with Suni to Mia's motive behind the attic allegation. In a written statement, Allen says, Regarding my love for Suni, it's real and happily all true. She's lovely, intelligent, sensitive woman who has and continues to turn my life around in a wonderfully positive way. But that's not what Mia Farrow's mother believes. Over the weekend, Maureen O'Sullivan's publicist spoke out on her behalf against Allen. This is a cheap shot from a desperate and evil man. As Mia's mother, and speaking for the rest of our family, it has been tragic to watch what she has gone through for the last seven months. Woody and Mia have been together for 12 years but never married and kept separate residences. Alan is now suing Farrow for custody of the son he had with her, plus their two adopted children. He says their breakup and the lawsuit has nothing to do with his relationship with Zuni. Alan says going to court was the last thing he wanted to do. Farrow has a total of 11 children. The Korean-born beauty was adopted by her and second husband conductor Andre Previn. Suni Previn is currently taking classes at a New Jersey college. Over on Manhattan's east side, where Woody Allen and Mia met, the owner of Elaine says Mia Farrow should not be so upset. What do you think about the relationship with uh, Mia's adopted daughter? Well, it's just like what Mia did with uh, Sinatra. It's the same thing, the same age difference in the way. Whatever makes everybody happy, let everybody enjoy themselves. They say art imitates life. Woody Allen has certainly mastered that. In his upcoming film, Husbands and Wives, he's set to play a professor who falls in love with a college student. I'm older than my father. Do you believe that? I'm dating a girl wherein I can beat up her father. Rosanna Scotto for Sky News, New York. Following his interview with Time magazine, Woody Allen provided statements to Newsweek. When asked by the outlet about the attic allegation, here's what Woody had to say. Quote, This is so laughable. First of all, I couldn't find the attic in Mia's house. I mean, I have never been in an attic. I'm a famous claustrophobic. Wild horses couldn't get me into an attic. It must be noted, however, that despite Woody Allen telling Newsweek magazine in 1992, that he had never been in Mia's attic, he would contradict his statements in January 1993 while being interviewed by the Connecticut State Police. In 1997, the state's attorney told a Connecticut news outlet the following, quote, Woody Allen spent several months refusing to submit to interviews. At one point, he tried to set preconditions. One of the preconditions was that any statements made by Allen could not be used to impeach him. The state police did not comply. Police found hair fibers in the crawl space consistent with Allen's and even fingerprints, physical evidence that placed him at the scene of the crime, but didn't necessarily prove culpability. 
Allen later conceded that not only was it possible that he might have reached into the crawl space on occasion, either to grab one of the children or to give them a soda, it was possible that his prints would be found there. According to the article, the police characterized his statements as inconsistent. It's important to note that the forensic specialist, chief of Connecticut State Crime Laboratory, Dr. Henry Lee, reported that the evidence found could not place Woody Allen in the attic despite the aforementioned claims. In her 1992 Newsweek interview, Suni defended Woody Allen against these allegations. According to Suni, Mia, who she claimed was consumed with rage, put Dylan up to this. She said, quote, The business of him molesting Dylan is so ridiculous that I won't dignify it with a comment. Why Dylan repeats her story is another matter, and a sinister one. I was not surprised that Mia made a videotape of Dylan saying these terrible things, as I think the motive is obvious. But I was stunned that the tape would somehow find its way to the TV news. I could say many devastating things about Mia, but I will only do it if I must in a court. From the beginning of their conflict, which I know Woody broke his neck to avoid for the kid's sake, I have refrained from commenting. But when Mia brought up child molestation and then had her sisters and mother and kids do her dirty work for her, climaxing with that tape of Dylan being given out, I felt I had to speak at this point. The tragedy here is that because of Mia's vindictiveness, the children must suffer. I will always have a feeling of love for her because of the opportunity she gave me, but it's hard to forgive much that followed. According to Suni, when the story broke, the videotape of Dylan was given to a news media outlet. Suni accused Mia and her family of being the ones behind the tape getting leaked. This information further destroyed Mia's image in the media with Vanity Fair writing, quote, most damning was the implied belief in Suni's statement to Newsweek that it was Mia or someone close to her who had got a copy of Dylan's videotape into the hands of New York's Fox Channel 5 News. Both Mia and her mother denied the charge. The tape never ran, but the station did not exonerate Mia from leaking it. Reporter Rosanna Scotto says, I wish we could, but to do so would narrow the field among the possible suspects. Woody Allen's fight with Mia Farrow for their children could be one of the biggest, ugliest scandals of its kind ever. Now Woody Allen may be facing still another investigation. And we have a follow-up to last night's exclusive report that made headlines around the world. A videotape of one of the children involved. Rosanna Scotto reports. Just one day after the very private Woody Allen went public denying Mia Farrow's accusations of child abuse, Fox News has learned that the investigation into the alleged sex of Mia Farrow and Woody Allen's adopted daughter has widened from Connecticut to right here in New York City. Sources tell us that the Manhattan District Attorney is now looking into the allegations of child abuse. When we called the DA, their office had no comment. We've also learned that the Department of Family and Children's Services is investigating too and interviewed the child and both parents. We've also seen a videotape in which Mia Farrow photographs and questions her daughter Dylan about an incident of alleged involving Woody Allen. The tape was made just one day after the alleged incident. Dylan seems teary-eyed as she describes what allegedly took place in the attic of their Bridgewater, Connecticut home. Dylan indicates with gestures what she claims happened. We will not give you any more details out of respect for all parties. One of the other children named in the custody suit, 14-year-old Moses Farrow, told the Boston Herald, Dylan is very upset because she's very close to her father. I am angry that he's even trying to get custody of us. I don't like what he did to my sisters. I feel that he took advantage of our trust. A prominent divorce attorney tells us charges of sex abuse are common in custody battles. Norman Sharesky also says a judge would have to look into these charges as well as the credibility of the videotape. It would have a lot more weight if you had that tape coupled with uh, the... Uh, an interview with a child by somebody who is expert at interviewing a child, uh, either a judge who knows what to do or a psychiatrist or psychologist, 
And, uh, you know, different children are, are capable of different kinds of accuracy when it, when it comes to reporting incidents. We've received late word from our source that Mia Farrow and her children have finally spoken to Suni after one month of silence. Suni is Mia's adopted daughter who Woody Allen now says is his lover. Suni was told she is loved, missed, and always welcomed home. According to our source, Suni said she will be coming home soon. In the fall of 1992, Connecticut State Prosecutor commissioned the Yale New Haven Children's Hospital Child Abuse Clinic to evaluate Dylan. According to Yale, they had two objectives. One, to determine if Dylan was telling the truth, and two, to determine if she was in fact S. aid. The team consisted of Dr. John Leventhal, a pediatrician, and two social workers, Dr. Julia Hamilton and Dr. Jennifer Sawyer. Over the course of their six-month investigation, they interviewed Christy the nanny, Woody Allen, Mia Farrow, Sophie the tutor, both Dylan psychotherapist Dr. Nancy Schultz and Dr. Susan Coates. They also evaluated Dylan, whom they interviewed nine times. In her book, Christy details the Yale New Haven investigation. Dylan's first session at Yale was on Wednesday, September 22nd, and every Friday thereafter, she would meet with the Yale New Haven team, who would talk to her for an hour or so. None of us know what her responses were. Not even Mia has seen the records, which were sealed and have since been destroyed. Dylan, at one of her first sessions, told the Yale team, I love my mother. That's all I have to say. I love my mother and I hate my dad. She confided that she had begun to feel this after she learned about Woody's affair with Suni. I'm like, why me? She said, why do I have to solve this problem? On October 2nd, Mia admitted to the Yale team that she had told Dylan, if you don't want daddy to be your daddy anymore, he doesn't have to be. Then on October 30th, Dylan dropped a little bomb in New Haven. She recanted her testimony. Dylan had earlier confided to her mother that Woody didn't do anything. Nothing happened, she said. Later that afternoon, however, Dylan contradicted herself and denied her denial. As Mia explained, she had simply gotten sick and tired of being grilled round the clock by a bunch of strangers. With the Yale New Haven investigation underway, the New York Child Welfare Administration was simultaneously conducting their investigation. Assigned to the case was a social worker by the name of Paul Williams. According to reports, Paul Williams found Dylan to be credible and felt that there was sufficient information to open a criminal investigation against Woody Allen. But shortly after Paul was assigned to the case, he was removed and later fired. Here's what Paul reported. Quote, Based on Dylan's demeanor and her responses to my questions and my conversations with the caseworker in Connecticut and my experience from interviewing hundreds of children who had been abused, I concluded that abuse did occur and that there was a prima facie cause to commence family court proceedings against Woody Allen. Then the barriers came down. There came a litany of reasons why we should not go forward. My superior said that Woody Allen is an influential person. She talked about his films and his position. As more evidence came through interviews, I insisted that the case should have been filed. Managers at the Child Welfare Agency responded that pressure to drop the case is coming all the way from the mayor's office. Paul's attorney, Bruce Barron, would corroborate his narrative and express his belief that his client was wrongfully terminated. Here's what he told news outlets. Quote, Paul was told that it was customary for the big wigs to take over in high profile cases and he was reassigned. When he wouldn't shut up, they fired him. Though it's been speculated that this was some sort of a cover up, Woody Allen's attorney denied those claims. According to him, that was not the case. He claims that Paul's lack of professionalism and bias against Woody Allen are what got him fired. Here's what he had to say. Quote, he acted in a rude fashion and appeared to be biased against Woody Allen. 
They said he was insubordinate and that he was not following instructions. A new twist in the Woody Allen custody battle. This time, the city is right in the middle of what has become a very tangled case. Rosanna Scotto has new and surprising details. While the Department of Investigation began looking into allegations that the city helped Woody Allen in connection with the child abuse accusations, the Child Welfare Administration was giving its documents to Allen's attorney. Attorney Elkin Abramowitz then sent Fox News five pages from that file. Now sparks are flying between Mia Farrow's and Woody Allen's attorneys. I find that shocking, and I think it's an inappropriate and improper and uh also should be considered as part of this investigation. It's indicative of the way Woody Allen has dealt with the case in the beginning. Uh, I don't think he has any of the interests of the children, but really is a desperate man trying to uh, destroy a family in the media. When the uh, file is officially released to the subject of the investigation, that person is free to re-release it. And it is not anywhere remotely uh, a crime or any, any kind of impropriety whatsoever. And if she had simply read the statute instead of trying to grab a headline, she would have known that. This latest controversy stems from a published report in the New York Observer. According to this newspaper, in the file of Paul Williams, a caseworker for the Child Welfare Administration, there are notes indicating the city allegedly tried to help Woody Allen. Allen's attorney, Abramowitz, was given other child welfare documents that attempt to discredit caseworker Williams. Now all this is being looked into by DOI, the Department of Investigation. You may remember that DOI was the agency which appointed Abramowitz two years ago to investigate Mayor Dinkins' stock transfer to his son. DOI says Elkin Abramowitz will not get any special consideration. They refuse to comment further. The mayor's office says he never gets involved with child welfare cases. And the Child Welfare Administration refused to say anything except they were the ones to call for this investigation. Rosanna Scotto, Fox News. In December 1992, Dylan made additional claims to the Connecticut State Police, who were looking into the allegation she made against her father, Woody Allen. According to reports, Dylan told investigators about another incident where Woody allegedly inappropriately touched her. In her book, Mia writes, quote, In December, Dylan told the police about another occasion when she was climbing up to the ladder of a bunk bed in the playroom. She said that Woody had slipped his hand inside her shorts and touched her there. And she was illustrating graphically where? In the genital area. When asked by Newsweek about allegations of him fondling his children, here's what Woody had to say. Quote, well, absolutely, but not in any sexual way. There is no person in the world that will come into court and say anything like that and stand up to any kind of cross-examination. I've been a model, model father with these kids. I mean, I'm affectionate like my parents were with me, but that's it. She wrote a glowing, glowing letter um, or an affidavit saying that I was um, just a loving and a caring and attentive father and that I was uh, that my adopting Dylan would be great benefit to her. This was her uh, sworn affidavit. Uh, you know. When did she write it? She wrote it in December of last year. A month before things exploded? Yes. Is it possible that Mia was just so upset by everything that had happened uh, that something convinced her that something had happened to Dylan? Oh, that right. I don't know, but I mean, nothing... I mean, nothing, is there room for there that no misunderstanding? There is no possibility, there is no possibility that anything remotely ever happened to Dylan or, or that I ever did anything to Dylan. And I'm saying not even Is it in possible a that Mia way. believes that? She may believe it and want to believe it. She may believe it and have convinced herself of it. Or she may not believe it in the most cynical version of it. Uh, you know, Sunni believes that she does not believe it. Sunni thinks that it's absolutely in character that she has made it up quite calculatingly. It's such a pernicious allegation. Mm-hmm. Very difficult to disprove. Mm-hmm. On March 17, 1993, after a six-month investigation, Yale New Haven reached a conclusion. 
In part, here's what they had to say. Quote, it is our expert opinion that Dylan was not as aid by Mr. Allen. Further, we believe that Dylan's statements on videotape and her statements to us during our evaluation do not refer to actual events that occurred to her on August 4th, 1992. In developing our opinion, we considered three hypotheses to explain Dylan's statements. First, that Dylan's statements were true and that Mr. Allen had essayed her. Second, that Dylan's statements were not true, but were made up by an emotionally vulnerable child who was caught up in a disturbed family and who was responding to the stresses in the family. And third, that Dylan was coached or influenced by her mother, Miss Farrow. While we can conclude that Dylan was not essayed, we cannot be definitive about whether the second formulation by itself or the third formulation by itself is true. We believe that it is more likely that a combination of these two formulations best explains Dylan's allegations of S.A. The major reasons for our opinion that Dylan was not S.A. are the following. One, there were important inconsistencies in Dylan's statements in the videotape and in her statements to us. Two, she appeared to struggle with how to tell us about the touching. Three, she told the story in a manner that was overly thoughtful and controlling. There was no spontaneity in her statements, and a rehearsed quality was suggested in how she spoke. Four, her descriptions of the details surrounding the alleged events were unusual and were inconsistent. When Woody Allen and his team received the Yale New Haven findings, they were elated. For Mia Farrow, however, it was a complete shock and a huge blow. Experts at Yale New Haven Hospital back Woody Allen's claims that he did not use his adopted daughter, Dylan. Good evening. The filmmaker says the report out today supports what he said all along, that he did not his adopted daughter, Dylan. Allen also says the report recommends that Mia Farrow seek psychiatric help. Channel 3's Dennis House was on hand for this latest, but not the last chapter in the Woody and Mia saga. They showed up within minutes of each other. The accuser in a white limo, the accused in a black one. The former lovers, along with a throng of reporters, were at Yale New Haven Hospital to find out if child sex experts believed Farrow's claim that Alan Mal their seven-year-old adopted daughter, Dylan. The conclusion is that no, no sexual ever took place, and there is a strong recommendation that Mia herself seek psychiatric help. The Yale group, which spent months investigating the allegations as part of a state police inquest, refused to comment on the report. But Allen says the report found that Dylan had not been molested, even though she told doctors her father had sex her. And according to Alan, Dylan may have been programmed to tell the sordid tales of abuse. It was either a, an imagined thing or a concocted thing. It all began last summer when Farrow accused her companion of 12 years of molesting Dylan at the actress's Bridgewater home. The allegations came after Alan admitted to having an affair with Farrow's daughter, Sunyi Previn, whom she adopted with former husband Andre Previn. The story made headlines around the and world. Would Woody publicly denied the charges while Mia avoided the media. And she uttered only 13 words after the Yale report was released. Um, I, I just want to say that, um, that I will always stand by my children. Farrow's lawyer, who once said the Yale team was the best, criticized the report. The Yale group, comprised of two social workers and a pediatrician, ha has issued a report which is incomplete and inaccurate. Alter claims an eyewitness to the alleged abuse was never interviewed, which would support the Yale videotape of Dylan talking about the incident. But Yale reportedly concluded the tape had been doctored. The former couple and co-stars left New Haven appearing a bit tired after their closed-door meeting, a face-to-face -face that Alan says was unemotional. No, there was no crying. She wasn't crying, I wasn't crying. No, it was very uneventful. You'd be very bored. The Woody and Mia saga isn't over by any means. Alan says he will now sue for custody of the couple's three children, Dylan, Satchel, and Moses. And it still remains to be seen whether the Yale New Haven report will be enough to persuade police, both here in Connecticut and in New York, to drop their criminal investigations. 
On the night beat in New Haven, I'm Dennis House, Channel 3 Eyewitness News. On March 19, 1993, two days after the Yale New Haven report was released, Woody Allen and Mia Farrow appeared in court for their custody battle. Their case came before Justice Wilk in New York Supreme Court. Both Woody and Mia presented testimony, witnesses, and experts who could help prove their case against the other. But one expert witness on Mia's behalf would challenge the Yale New Haven report, a report that Woody and his team believed exonerated him. The expert witness was Dr. Herman, a clinical psychiatrist. In her book, Christy details his testimony. She writes, Dr. Herman noted that it was, quote, unfortunate that Mia and not an objective and trained evaluator videotaped Dylan's testimony, mainly because the way she focused on specific things could possibly set a tone for a child about how to answer. I think it could raise anxieties of a child. I don't think it helps matters. I think it complicates matters, he said. Herman took exception to a number of significant Yale New Haven findings. First, he pointed out that the team's methodology was flawed in several ways. He said, to destroy written notes in a case which is clearly going to have legal ramifications is a mistake, particularly when you have a team approach and when you are combining notes, in this case from three different individuals. Dr. Herman felt there were problems regarding the interviews with the principals. He said, if you are going to come to a conclusion that a child should have visitation with a parent, it's extremely important in your evaluation to be able to justify why that visitation is important. And one of the ways to do that is to bring a child and parent together. However, Woody and Dylan were never interviewed together. Dr. Herman, under oath, discussed other serious mistakes in the Yale report. One was at the indication of a comment from Dr. Schultz that she feared that Dylan was, quote, psychotic, said Dr. Herman. Dr. Schultz has testified that she never felt that Dylan is or was psychotic. And Dr. Schultz's notes to my reading nowhere reflect her concerns that this child is psychotic. In the Yale report, it's given as a historical fact, and that, to me, is a major glaring error. Dr. Herman went on to challenge the report's conclusions that Dylan was inconsistent about where she was touched, saying, quote, There are also a number of areas of consistency which the report does not focus on. In response to Yale's accusation that Dylan was incredible because she told the story in a manner that was overly thoughtful and controlling. Herman says this does not necessarily bear on the truthfulness of her statement. It is instead personality characteristics. As to the team's dismissal of Dylan because the way she talked about the events in the attic made them seem like a minor transgression, Herman replied, it could be a child's way of coping with something which is very serious and upsetting and the child could present it in a way very understated or contained way. As to the report's conclusion, it is our expert opinion that Dylan was not as aid by Woody. Herman noted in court, quote, I think it's very dangerous to conclude that a specific person did or did not harm a child unless there is some kind of overwhelming corroborative evidence to support that. Either a very believable witness or it's incontrovertible fact, or you culture a sexually transmitted organism from the alleged perpetrator, and it's the same one that is cultured from a child. Absent that, it's very difficult for a clinician to know. Furthermore, one could easily read this report, in my opinion, and conclude that Dylan was abused, and I can just as easily look at the data and say, well, she consistently said he touched me here in this way over and over again. She's very upset. She's very angry. Children, whether they are or aren't disturbed, can be abused and can tell the truth even if they are disturbed. And because a child is disturbed doesn't mean that she's fantasizing. Dr. Herman would conclude 
that though he found the report to be seriously flawed, the report was not biased, and in light of the evidence, he could not reach any conclusion about the allegation of abuse. According to Christie, Dr. Herman wasn't alone because she also couldn't say with complete certainty that Dylan was SA'd by Woody. After a seven-week hearing, Judge Wilk ruled on the custody case on June 7, 1993. In part, here's his judgment. Quote, Mr. Allen's relationship with Dylan remains unsolved. The evidence suggests that it is unlikely that he could be successfully prosecuted for S.A. I am less certain, however, than is the Yale New Haven team, that the evidence proves conclusively that there was no S.A. Dr. Coates and Dr. Schultz expressed their opinions that Mr. Allen did not S.A. Dylan. Neither Dr. Coates nor Dr. Schultz has expertise in the field of child SA. I believe that their opinions of Dr. Coates and Dr. Schultz may have been colored by their loyalty to Mr. Allen. Unlike Yale New Haven, I am not persuaded that the videotape of Dylan is the product of leading questions or of the child's fantasy. Richard Marcus, a retired New York City police officer called by Mr. Allen, testify that he worked with the police sex crimes unit for six years. He claimed to have an intuitive ability to know if a person is truthful or not. I did not find his testimony to be insightful. I agree with Dr. Herman in that we will probably never know what occurred on August 4th, 1992. The credible testimony of Ms. Farrow, Dr. Coates, Dr. Leventhal, and Mr. Allen does, however, prove that Mr. Allen's behavior toward Dylan was grossly inappropriate and that measures must be taken to protect her. And what were those measures? Judge Wilk denied Woody's request for full custody of Dylan, Moses, and Satchel. After hearing weeks of testimony from Woody, Mia, Suni, the children, the nannies, the psychotherapist, the experts, etc., Judge Wilk did not find Mia to be an unfit parent, nor did he find her to be abusive toward her children. She maintained full custody of the kids. Moving forward, Woody would have supervised visitation with Satchel. He could see Moses if Moses allowed, but he was not allowed to see Dylan or have any contact with her. On September 24th, 1993, Connecticut State's attorney, announced that he would not be pursuing criminal charges against Woody Allen. The following month, in October, the New York Child Welfare Administration dropped their investigation as they claimed they found, quote, no credible evidence of assault. Upon news that these investigations had been dropped, Woody Allen made a public statement. In part, here's what he said, quote, while one might think that I would be happy or grateful with the decision to drop the investigation by the Connecticut authorities. I am merely disgusted that my children have been made to suffer unbearably by the unwholesome alliance between a vindictive mother and a cowardly, dishonest, irresponsible state's attorney and its police. Even today, as they squirm, lie, sweat, and tap dance, pathetically trying to save face and justify their moral squalor by declaring the investigation as being terminated because he and the mother suddenly do not want to put my daughter through anymore, their cheap scheming reeks of sleaze and deception. The reason the authorities are dropping this case is purely and simply because they know there is no chance they could possibly win it. There is no evidence against me. There is none now. I promise you, smear as they may, they will always claim to have evidence, but notice that somehow they will manage to find reasons why they can't show it to you. I want to send this message to my little girl. I'm sorry that I missed your eighth birthday, but they just wouldn't let me do it. I love you and I miss you. And don't worry, the dark forces will not prevail not second-rate police or publicity-hungry prosecutors, not judicial setbacks, not tabloid press, nor those who perjure themselves 
nor all who rush to judgment, not the pious or hypocritic or the bigoted. I'm too tough for all of them put together. Finally, to Mia. Having just said all I said, I now reverse myself and beg for peace. If the Arabs and Israel can do it, we can. I publicly apologize for hurting you. I know you can be forgiving and quite terrific at times. You're a first-rate actress and a beautiful woman. As I said in front of the Yale New Haven experts, Judge Wilk, Judge Roth, and now for the sake of little children, let's end all hostilities instantly and settle our situation. Not next month or next week, but today. I promise to do my best to be accommodating and would hope you would also be generous. Please, let's now put this behind us. The only prerequisite I have is that you stop sending me bills from Alan Dershowitz. Thank you. What do you say to that? I'm really sorry. Don't apologize. Don't apologize. I thought I could handle it. I am. Um... Are you crying because of what he said or seeing him? What is upsetting you? He's lying and he's been lying for so long. 